All right, is that better? Okay, so I'll go ahead and start. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire? Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Okay, and I'm going to read just one more verse from chapter 2, and that'll wrap up what we're reading. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Okay, go ahead and be seated, please. So there was a, a Sunday school teacher with a group of teens giving her class assignment for the next week for them. And she said, uh, next Sunday, we're going to talk about liars. And in preparation for our lesson, I want you all to read Mark 17. The following week, at the beginning of the class, the teacher said, okay, whoever read Mark 17, I want you to come up to the front of the classroom okay and so about half the class came up and stood at the front of the classroom they're pretty pleased with themselves you know well she said the rest of you could leave these students are the ones I want to talk to about lying because there is no 17th chapter in the book of Mark okay so that that story had nothing to do with the message here, but I thought it was funny anyways. And I thought it might wake us up and get our brains working, so. Okay, so who is the audience that, that the writer here is speaking to? Now, the book is named Hebrews for a good reason. The writer of the book of Hebrews, he is speaking... are not having a very good experience so far in Christianity. And they're, looking, they're thinking back to what worship was like in the Old Covenant, what it was like meeting in synagogues, and going to the temple in Jerusalem, what it was like enjoying the Feast of the Passover, uh, and what it was like doing all these things the old way. 
And so they're thinking about going back to the old way, okay? Where you, where you have the high priest and the priests all dressed in, in very fine garments, okay? Where it appears beautiful. But in the new covenant, the physical appearance isn't very beautiful. They're meeting in caves, they're meeting in basements, they're meeting in houses and attics. And uh, in uh, the old covenant, you had... You had a, an angel that would, an angel from the Lord that would appear before someone and, and tell them what they should do. Okay, like for, for uh, in the case of uh, Moses, you know, you have uh, in the case of Abraham, you know, the, and when an angel of the Lord appears, you get down on your face and you get down to the ground because there's a fear there when an angel of the Lord appears. But in the new covenant. You have a common man who, who, someone who looked, he said, uncomely, did not look beautiful, did not have an attractive appearance. Jesus looked like an average man. You would not be able to tell him out of a crowd. And not only that, but he didn't come conquering. He came and was crucified. So they're thinking back to the Old Testament and the Old Covenant and the old ways, and they're looking at the New Covenant and Jesus Christ, and it's not as attractive to some of them. And they're thinking about going back to the old ways. So, so we want to understand who, who this audience is that the writer is speaking to. By the way, we don't know exactly who wrote the book of Hebrews. Some believe it was Paul. Some believe it may have been Priscilla. Some believe it may have been Apollos. There's actually many different uh, possible authors for the book of Hebrews, but we don't know. But we know that, that God inspired this book and that uh, what we're going to read actually is one of the more in-depth books in the New Testament about the New Covenant and gives one of the best uh, overlays of going from the Old Testament, quoting the Old Testament, and comparing the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And so Hebrews is a very beautiful book, but it's, it's one of these books that even if we go through verse by verse, chapter by chapter, you will not be able to uncover everything. You will not be able to uncover everything. There's just so much depth in this book that uh, you could spend a long time studying it. But we, we will try to cover as much as we can. So starting out here in verse 1, he says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. That, that word there, sundry times, means different times. During different times, he spake to different people. In different ways, he spoke in diverse manners. Okay, why do you think, what would be the point of the writer saying this? I'm sorry? Go ahead. What? Well, he's, he, he is he's speaking about Jesus Christ specifically. Jesus Christ. Um, and about how he had been prophesied many different times and in different ways. Okay, that's what he's saying here. God had prophesied about Jesus Christ, about the Son of God coming, in many times and in many different ways. But why would that be important? I mean, why not just have one person tell us all about it one time, prophesy, just, just have, why, why not just have Moses? Okay, Moses, you get the whole prophecy. Okay? And you're going to tell everyone exactly about everything. Okay? Why not just do it that way? You know? Well, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's things that... But I think God has a... Uh, God, God wants us to be thinkers. He's given us a brain. And if he gave everything to one person, okay, what I would really wonder is this. I mean, is it really from God? Or is it from that person? You see, people in different generations, they can't conspire together 
to make some you know, new religion or make some, they can't just come together and say, you know, you can't go and meet uh, Christopher Columbus from, you know, 1400s because he's not alive today. You can't conspire with him, okay? So when you're thinking about all these different religions that are coming at you, okay, that are saying that this is how God is, this is what the gods are, this is, you know, there's so many different religions at that time, having revelation given to, let's say, Moses, given to Abraham, given to David, given to uh, Isaiah, in all these different people at different times and in different ways, but saying much of the same types of things, then I can know that it must be the hand of God. It's the hand of divine authorship when it's handled that way. Okay? And you think about it. When you go through the scriptures, Jesus Christ was actually spoken about all the way back in Genesis. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3, when God said to the serpent in front of Adam and Eve, to Satan, he said uh, that, that, he will, uh, that Eve's seed would bruise his head, and he would bruise his heel. The serpent would bruise his heel. Speaking about Jesus Christ. When uh, God said, these leaves are not enough to clothe your nakedness, I need to sacrifice. I need to sacrifice. Blood needs to be shed to cover your nakedness. Okay? Pictures and types are given all the way back in Genesis. Uh, also, when we, when we go through and we see Abraham, was given pictures and types when he went to sacrifice his son Isaac and God sent a replacement for Isaac. We see uh, pictures and types when, uh, when God told the Israelites through Moses to kill a lamb and to spread the blood on the doorpost, okay, so that the, the death angel would pass over them, okay, and that began the Passover and not kill the, the firstborn. When so, so we have all of these things, or when, let's say when, you know, David, David was told many times about Jesus Christ, about the Son, and we'll look at some of these passages that are referenced here. But it was in different times and in different ways, because that way we can know it's from God. I'll give you an example of, of someone, see, see God, doesn't, God doesn't want us to blindly follow. He wants us to use our brains he says, come, let us reason together, okay? So he wants us to use our brains. He wants us to discern truth, okay? He wants us to, to study, to show ourselves approved. But I'll give you an example of someone who, one person said they had some new revelation from God. You've probably all heard of Mormons. There was a man named Joseph Smith, and he said he received these new revelations from God, these tablets that he didn't show to anyone, and that he said, okay, I transcribed from these tablets with the help of an angel. So it was one man, okay, and he's adding to the scripture what was already complete. And so you have to sit, if you've studied the scripture, you have to really wonder, what is going on here? This must be a scam. Because that's not the way God gives revelation. That's not the way God gives uh, authors his truth. That's not the way God communicates to his people. So we know that it, because it came through one man, we know that that's a lie. Okay? We, without even reading it, we already know that God did not author it through several people. And also, God already has completed his word. In Revelation, it says that if any man should add unto these words, or if any man shall subtract from these words, that he will take away their name out of the book of life. So, throughout time and in many ways, God has showed a unified message. Let's go on to verse number 2. It says in verse 2, one moment. Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, 
whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So it says that he has appointed him heir of all things, and that, that word heir is the Greek word kleron omas. And it means, kleron means to inherit, omas means by the law, it's, it's legal, it's a binding, uh, it, it's it implies that this is to inherit by the law. So, you know, God throughout uh, creation and throughout man, uh, the, the way we structure things, throughout many different things, God has given us pictures and types of eternal things. He's given us pictures and types of spiritual eternal things. So, for example, when uh, throughout history, okay, the oldest son would inherit everything from his father, okay? The oldest son would be the one to inherit all things from his father, okay? So this was to show us, this was, this was to reveal to us that also in the eternal, the son of God will inherit all things as well, okay? There's many times that we, we have physical things that, that we've been given, that we've been taught, that are to introduce us or to show us about the spiritual things. And so it says here that Jesus is heir. It says here that uh, he hath appointed Jesus, his son, to be heir of all things. Okay? Not only that, though, it, it contrasts it with the fact that Jesus was the one by whom he also made the worlds. And the word there, the worlds, doesn't, is not talking about planets. Okay? This, this word is actually the word for ages, okay? for time periods, okay? that he's made the various time periods. Okay? So it, it, it's often translated as ages. Okay? So when it says, like, for example, uh, the uh, Jesus said, you know, in this world or the world to come, okay? He's not talking about a planet, but he's talking about a time period, an age, okay? In this time period or the time period to come. So Jesus is the one that had, with God, had made this age and also is making the next, is creating the, the heavenly age. who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now this, this verse is just so much packed into one verse. Uh, first, we want to look at this word express image. This word express image in the Greek is character. And it's actually where we get the word character from. Okay, it's where we get the word character from. And what it means is it's like a stamp. Okay, it's a stamp, a legal proof. Okay, when uh, you have a business, okay, you go to the Ministry of Commerce, you submit the stamp. And that stamp is used for proof that your business approved of something. So if you stamp something, then that means your business approved of that. Okay? And that's what this, this word here, uh, character, it, this word express image, means a stamp. Okay? That Jesus is essentially the stamp, the physical evidence, the proof of God. Him coming proves to us that there is a God. There is one God. He's promised it. But now that Jesus has come, the evidence is there. The evidence is there. He's all the proof that we need that there is a God who loves you. There is a God who is righteous. And there is a God who came and he is the stamp, he is the proof 
of who God is. And it says, uh, of his person. The word there, of, of his person, is hypostasis. And it means to be a, a stand or a pedestal, something you can stand on, a foundation, okay, that you can put your footing on, okay, that you can stand up on, okay. The, the word uh, hupo means a, a stand, while the word stasis means something you can put your confidence in, something you can trust on, okay. So it's not just a stamp, but it's a stamp we can put our trust on. It's a stamp we can put our faith on. Jesus Christ is that stamp, is that proof of God. And upholding all things, upholding all things by the word of his power. That, that word upholding means to carry all things, to carry all things by the word of his power. When uh, he had by himself purged our sins. So there were three things that were mentioned there. Let's just go back here. It says, who being the brightness of his glory, there's one, okay? Who being the brightness of his glory, Jesus Christ is the brightness of God's glory. The proof, the express image of his person, okay? And number three, upholding all things by the word of his power. Okay? So Jesus is, is the brightness of his person, or the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and is the one who will fulfill all of his promises through the power of his word. Okay? Jesus accomplishes all three of those things for God, is what the writer is saying here. And what, how did he do that? How did he do that? All of those things were accomplished when he, by himself, purged our sins. When he went to Calvary and died on the cross for us and rose again, he became the brightness of God's glory. He became the express image of God's person. He carried out the promises of God. He accomplished all those things at the cross. So this is it's very packed here. And the, these sentences really seem like run-on sentences. But I want to just, let's unfold it here. And when he accomplished that, when he did all of that, then he sat down on the right hand of the majesty of God. Okay, one moment, please. Okay, we'll come to that later. All right, so let's go to verse 4. And the point that, that the author is getting at here is that Jesus is much better than the angels. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath obtained, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So Jesus, now remember that, that in the Old Covenant, if you saw an angel, if you saw an angel, you got down on your face. Okay? You, you watch every time uh, uh, that the, the, the angel would have to say to them, fear not. Fear not. Okay? When you saw an angel, you got down on your face. But what the writer is saying here is that Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ, who came and was sacrificed and rose again, is so much better than those angels. So much better than those messengers who were bringing God's word. Okay. Let's go on to verse number five. And now, now the writer is going to go through some Old Testament to unravel some of these verses, these passages that have been given throughout the ages in the Old Testament. He says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. 
So this verse, this verse actually comes out of Psalms chapter 2, verse 7. Let's go to Psalms chapter 2. Why, let's start at verse number 1, sorry, verse number 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder, cast away their, their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So that's the whole passage he's referencing when he says, Who, which angel did he say? Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. A couple years ago, when I was in, uh, when I was in college, I worked a, a part-time job um, in sales. And uh, so I went to several people's houses and tried to sell you know, certain things, and uh, actually an air purifier. And uh, I, I met a lot of different people through my work in sales. I actually had met, um, and you've heard of Jehovah's Witnesses, right? So I had met some Jehovah's Witnesses, and, and the couple that I met, they were an older couple in, in Illinois, um, kind of higher up in the Jehovah's Witnesses, okay? And after going through my whole sales pitch, and you know, we were working out the paperwork, and, and then we got talking about scriptures. And so they said to me, they said, well, we don't believe, we don't believe that Jesus Christ is God, or that he is eternal, that he always existed. And they quoted one verse out of this chapter. They said, well, he said, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Okay, so I want to ask you guys something. And, and we're not going to, we'll, we'll look at it in a minute here, but I want to ask you guys something. We'll get a show of hands, okay? And it's okay if you're wrong on this, okay, but we'll, we'll look at exactly what the scriptures say. But let's get a show of hands. I'm going to give you three options, okay? When was this fulfilled? When was this fulfilled that, that uh, God said to Jesus, Thou art my son, this day have I, I begotten thee. Option one, sometime before creation. Option two, when Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit in Mary. Or option three, when Jesus rose again. So I want a show of hands. Who thinks option one, sometime before creation, raise your hand. Okay. Option two, who thinks that this was when Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit in Mary? Raise your hand. If you think it was when Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit in Mary. Okay, and option three. If you believe it was when Jesus rose again. Who here believes it was when Jesus rose again? Okay, about 90% of you didn't raise your hand for any of those. So I'm guessing you're just like, we don't know. We don't know. Tell us. Okay, so we're going to have a look at this. Now, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses were trying to say that it was sometime before creation. That's what they were trying to tell me. But I took them to a passage in Acts chapter 13. We're going to go there now. And verse 
32 and 33. Now, just to give you some background here, Paul, the Apostle Paul, is in Antioch at the synagogue. And he's preaching to the Jews there at the synagogue at Antioch. And at one point in the passage, he brings up this verse. And he tells us exactly when this was fulfilled. I don't have to wonder. I don't have to think about it. I can read exactly what he said. It, there's no question what he said. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. As it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So when he fulfilled that was when Jesus rose again. You see, <laughs> you see in the psalm, the second psalm was a prophecy. It was not speaking about some time in which Jesus would be, was created in some time past. No, it had nothing to do with that. Jesus is always, God has always existed. And he's one person, just like you and I, we have a flesh, we have a mind, and we have a soul. Well, God, he has a flesh, he's come in the flesh. He has a mind, God the Father. And he has a spirit, the Holy Spirit. He's given us this, he's made us in his image so we can understand who he is. So, Jesus is God. And he has always existed. But when he came, when he came to become flesh, when he took on flesh, okay, When he became flesh and he went to the cross and he was crucified for our sins. He did that for our sins. Okay? And then he rose again. At that point, that was when God said, God the Father said to God the Son, Thou art my Son. This day have I begotten thee. You see, in the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, God was not flesh and blood. God was not flesh and blood. But he became flesh through Jesus Christ. He became 100% man. He had all of the same desires that we have. He had all of the same, everything the same as we had. Yet without sin. Yet he did not sin. And he was crucified to offer a sacrifice for us. But when Jesus rose again, he had a new body. He had a new body. And when I say a new body, it's a body that had never existed before. Something new that had never existed before. And at that point, that was when God said to the Son, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Now we don't know fully in scope about that new body. We know he walked through walls. We know that he was able to ascend up into heaven and come back down and ascend back up. And we also know that someday we will have the same body. That he is the firstborn among many brethren. But the focus here is on the inheritance, on the excellency of Christ. I would like to go back, though, and I would like to... Let's, let's look at Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews, actually we're going to go forward. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 through 14. Because I want to look at when, exactly when did God say this. And so we, we can have a better understanding of what this means when he says, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. But Christ being come, an high priest of good things to come, 
by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And let's go back to uh, John chapter 20, verse 17. An often uh, overlooked passage. Jesus just rose from the dead. And Mary Magdalene had come to, uh, to anoint the body. But speaking to who she thought was the gardener, says, where's the body? And then Jesus, when he revealed that he was Jesus... Uh, this uh, Jesus, she, she was ready to, to grab a hold of him. But Jesus says this. He says in verse 17, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Okay? So at that time, he had not yet presented the sacrifice in the holiest of holies. He had not yet presented the blood to the Father. But this was right before he was going up to do that. Okay, This was right before that was to happen. And he told Mary, don't touch me because I have not yet ascended. Now, after he came back down, he had no problem with being touched. He even said to Thomas, if you go to verse 27, put your finger in my side and see the scars in my hands. He had no problem with being touched after that, but there was something he had not yet completed at this point. So we can know exactly when, when God said this to the Son. And it was when he had brought the, himself as a sacrifice before God, when he had completed his work, when he rose again, that is when God said, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. And that's also when, you know, we see these three things, that at that, that time when he purged our sins, he became the brightness of his glory. He became the express image of his person, and he carried out the promises of God at that time. Okay, so... I'm not sure if we're going to finish the chapter today, but we'll... we'll uh, <laughs> I didn't expect it to take this long, so we'll, we'll keep going here. Let's go on to verse. Uh, let's go on to verse six. And let the angels of God worship him. Sorry, let's go back to Hebrews one six. Okay, and I guess I'm missing one of the verses here. That's okay. Um, going on to verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. So, this particular verse, if you go through the Old Testament, uh, it's a bit hard to find exactly which verse this is. And the reason why is because... Um, if we go through the Old Testament, there's actually a particular verse in the Septuagint that's exactly identical to this verse, okay? But in the English, um, it's not exactly identical. So let's go to Deuteronomy 32, verse 43. And we'll, we'll have a look at both the um, King James Version, and we'll also have a look at the Septuagint, so you can see uh, that the message is the same, but there's just a, a little bit more depth in the Septuagint uh, for this. It says, Deuteronomy 32, 43, Rejoice 
O ye nations, with his people. Okay? This exact passage, when they translated it from the Hebrew into the Greek, they had a problem because the word used was not just limited to people only, but also to the angels. So it was to mean the, the nations wasn't just to mean the, only the Gentiles, but also to mean the, the angels as well. So that when they translated it into the Septuagint, they specified out that, O oh, rejoice all ye angels, O oh, rejoice all ye people, all ye nations. So they split it up into two parts because there was just a lot more. Even Hebrew is such a, a beautiful language and sometimes it can have such depth, such meaning in a few words. So they had to expand it out in the Greek for that to, um, for, the, for the, the full meaning, to get the full meaning of what this, this word, these words here are. And if we look at the Septuagint, now keep in mind that the Septuagint is what they used, what during that time of Christ, and also Christ quoted from the Septuagint several times, it's also uh, what they studied from. Because a lot of, a lot of people at that time they did not uh, know Hebrew, they knew Greek. So that's what they studied from, just like we study from English. So vor verse 43 reads this. Rejoice, you heavens, with him, and let all the angels of God worship him. Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people, and let all the sons of God strengthen themselves in him. So just a couple of words there, and it has a lot more meaning in the, the Greek. Um, so that's exactly, exactly word for word what's being quoted from here, okay, in Hebrews. One moment. So let the angels of God worship him. Well, why is it important that we know that the angels worship, were commanded by God to worship Jesus Christ? Why is that important? If Jesus Christ was less than the angels, why would they be worshiping him? Why would God have commanded them? So therefore, Jesus Christ, not just Jesus Christ, but the, the new covenant. Jesus Christ is better than the angels. The new covenant is also better than the old covenant. Okay? That's what we're going to keep seeing here, is that as we go through the book of Hebrews, we keep seeing how Jesus Christ is better than. Jesus Christ is is better than. The new covenant through Jesus Christ is better than the old covenant and the Old Testament. The sacrifice was better than the old sacrifices. The priesthood is better than the old priesthood. We are going to keep seeing that. So yeah, Jesus Christ is better than the angels. Now we go to uh, verse c continuing on. It says, Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers of flaming fire. This is from Psalm 104. Psalm 104, verse 4. And you notice here that the writer is taking passages out from different authors in the Old Testament. He's taking passages from various authors in the Old Testament who were separated by many generations to make the same point. So the message that God gave to Moses was the same as the message he gave to David, was the same as the message he gave to Samuel, the same as the message he gave to Isaiah about Jesus Christ. All pointing to Christ. So we see here in Psalm 104.4 it says, Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers of flaming fire. Okay. And then going back to going back to Hebrew verse 7. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. This one is from Psalm 45. 6 and 7.
where it says, uh, let's start at verse 5, 45 verse 5. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments smell of myrrh and oil, smir, smell of myrrh and alloys and cassia out of the ivory places whereby they have made thee glad. And then on to uh, verse 8 through 12 is another passage which comes from Psalms 102, verse 25 through 27. Let's go to Psalm 102, verse 25 through 27. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. So if that is about Jesus Christ, then that means that Jesus Christ has no end. What he did on the cross was complete, and it's eternal. What he did on the cross is eternal. That sacrifice he made for us will never be undone. The sins that have been forgiven will never be brought back up. Okay, so we are, we're almost 10 o'clock here, so uh, we're going to call it. We'll stop right there because uh, I still have more to unfold here. So let's uh, go ahead and pray and we'll, or I'll let um, Pastor take over.